um, this morning I want to, um, this first service we were essentially talking about the nature of the biblical descriptions of who the Messiah is, who Jesus is, and what he is coming to do. And we were talking about the nature of the age to come, um, the reason that we embrace the cross every day, and all of these kind of things. This is the primary focus of what we call the end times. Okay, the end times is not primarily about things like the Antichrist and the Mark of the Beast and the Great Tribulation and the plagues and pestilences and all those sort of things. Those are the sort of the classic things that most people think about when you say the end times and they go, I have enough nonsense in my life right now. I don't really want to talk about some future tribulations. And so we kind of put that stuff on the shelf and I get that. But the primary focus from a biblical perspective on the end times is not the events that precede the return of Jesus, but it's the return of Jesus himself, and then the kingdom that will be established after he returns. So this is exactly why the Bible uses the language of birth pains, birth, right? And so, you know, if you're pregnant and you're expecting your first child, the primary focus is on the birth. It's not on the birth pains. If you're someone who, you know, your husband comes home from work and he's like, honey, man, the due date's coming up. Well, he doesn't say man. <laughs> honey, dude. <laughs> My kids, for some reason, started calling my wife bro. My, she'd be like, hey, bro. She's like, don't call me bro. Um, but the husband comes home from work, and, and uh, he's like, honey, you know, the due date's coming up. And, man, the birth pains are just right around the corner. You go like, what is wrong with you? And I think it's for some reason a lot of Christians are like that. We're like, yeah, let's talk birth pains. I'm like, Yes, the Lord wants us to understand the birth pains. He wants us to understand the events that precede his coming. Absolutely. But that's not the main focus. So that was sort of the primary emphasis of uh, this morning. And I think it's important for us to sort of have our priorities straight. Uh, this morning, I want to talk specifically about Islam and Muslims. And the reason that I want to talk about this is because I personally believe that Islam will play a very significant role in the end times. Um, there's sort of a coping mechanism in all of us that when we see something that scares us or worries us, we look for some type of story or mechanism whereby we can stop worrying about it. This is part of that whole process of grieving. You know, there's first thing is denial. And so within the church, there are a few different ways that a lot of Christians have tried to ignore the looming reality of global radical Islam. And one of those is through sort of some ideas that have been developed within biblical prophecy. And so there are Christians that say, oh, Islam is just going to get wiped out. It's just going to get eliminated in a series of battles. You know, they go Ezekiel 38, 39, the battle of Gog, Magog. Islam's just going to go away. Nothing to worry about. So this is just a coping mechanism whereby we don't have to face reality. We don't have to face the reality of what the future holds. That's sort of one mechanism um, in, on, on the much more, that's sort of the biblical prophecy side. On the more charismatic side, it's more of like, oh, the whole Islamic world's just going to be swept by revival. They're all going to be speaking in tongues. They're all going to get saved. Islam's going away. And for clarity, there is a revival, there is a movement in the Islamic world, but it's not enough to make the giant of Islam just go away. And so my primary heart is trying to help the church to come to terms with the reality of what lies in front of us. I want to see a generation of Davids. If this is the great Goliath, if this is the greatest challenge that we will face before the return of Jesus, then I want to see a generation of Davids rise, rise up that will say, Let's take this Goliath on. However, let's do it in a Jesus-centered, Jesus-focused way. We live in a, a day and age where, you know, I do a lot of work in the Middle East, again, with Muslims. Um, I'm part of the largest underground network in Iran. I, I help um, give some uh, partner in leadership with a ministry that's doing all kinds of work there. And I love seeing Muslims come to faith. We do a lot of work. We're partnering with the um, IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, to send Christian doctors into southern Syria and minister to Muslims there in southern Syria. And what's happened over the past several years where 
uh, prior to the Arab Spring, so 2010 and, and previous to that, there was a political ideology that sort of held the Middle East together, and it was called Arab nationalism. And this was the ideology, the political ideology that these various autocrats, dictators would use to keep their people in check. So they would say, we're all Arabs, you know, we're all Syrians. It doesn't matter if you're, if you're Druze or a Christian or a Sunni or a Shiite or Alawite or, you know, whatever, all of various sects and different people, we're all Syrians. And so th this sort of held together, we'll say, Syria um, for, for many years, for generations. But since the Arab Spring, the ideological winds of change have blown through the Middle East. And so now what we've had since 2011 is now Syria has broken up. It has balkanized. It has broken up into smaller, increasingly hostile little camps and units. Now it's, uh, we're no longer Syrians, now we're Sunnis, Shia, Alawites, Christians, Druze, Yazidis, Kurds, Arabs, you know what I'm saying? It's all these little units and now we've had close to a million people dead. Okay, so this is essentially what's happened in Syria and this is the, this is the plan of Satan and believe me, Jesus said in the last days, again, before he returns, he said we would see, as one of the primary signs, we would see kingdom rise up against kingdom and ethnos against ethnos. That's nation against nation. The word there in Greek is ethnos against ethnos. So you can, you can guarantee you that Satan wants to do exactly what he's done in Syria. You, you don't think he doesn't want to do it here in the United States? Of course he does. And, and so we live in this age right now where there are voices that say, which camp are you in? You know, are you, are you liberal? Are you conservative? Are you Republican? Are you Democrat? And the idea is that the world is so simple that you're either in one camp or the other. And the truth of the matter is, is that life is complicated. The world is complicated. People are complicated. And there's no such thing. I'm just, this is sort of a little sub-sermon that's on my heart. There's no such thing as, Black people think this. White people think this. The Republicans think this. No, it's not that simple. People are complicated. In any thinking person in a world that's so complicated is going to have a wide variety of opinions on a lot of very complicated issues. Well, where do you stand with regard to the Nike thing? Because that will determine whether or not I want to kill you or not. And so this is what Satan wants to do. Satan wants to put everybody in these increasingly hostile, little angry subunits. And we have to resist this. So, sorry, that's just something that's been on my heart. But it's the same thing with regard to Islam. Is within the church, people say, well, either you need to hate Islam and Muslims, or no, you need to love Islam and Muslims. And I go, guys, it's a little bit more complicated than that. It's a little bit more complicated than that. And so, in essence, this is sort of an issue of one of these, no, you know, you hate the sin, you love the sinner. We are called to confront something that I'll just come right out and say it, it's very evil. But that doesn't excuse us from loving people the way that Jesus loved us. And so it's essential that we come together as believers, gather around the scriptures and say, how do we address this, you know, because life is nuanced. How do we address this complicated, nuanced issue? So we're going to jump into a whole bunch of scripture. The first verse, passage that I want to look at is Romans 8, verse 15. It says, ye have not received the spirit of bondage to fear, but we have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Daddy, Abba, Father. I'm an adoptive father. I have two adoptive children. I can very much relate to the power of adoption and that spiritual bond that happens when you become the father to a child that needs a father. It's a, it's a powerful, powerful thing. All of us were once formerly enemies of God. That's what the scriptures say. He died for us while we were his enemies. In order that we could no longer be his enemies, we would be adopted as his children. We're children of God. We were formerly his enemies. This is what God did for us. So we understand that with the background. Jump to Genesis 16, 1 through 3, and we're going to, again, read a whole bunch of scripture. Now, this is the story of Abraham and his wife Sarah and Isaac and Ishmael. And in my opinion, this is the biblical story that sort of tells where Judaism Christianity and Islam sort of began. Where did this whole thing come from? Where did this 
where did this mess start with, if I can call it a mess? And so we begin with a story. This is before it was Abraham and Sarah. It was Sarai and Abram. The Lord had not changed their names yet. And so in verse 1 through 3, it says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. But she had an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. So she comes up with this great idea. Hey, Abram, the Lord has kept us from having children because he had promised that they're going to have children. Hadn't happened yet. They became impatient. She goes, here's a good idea, Abram. The Lord has kept us from having children. Go sleep with my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. And it's interesting that they, this is the way we all are. We try to put a fig leaf over something. We try to act as though it's sort of the spiritual um, godly thing. We try to cover our sin by using religious language. Hey, here's an idea. Maybe God wants to bless us through you sleeping with Hagar. That was bad idea number one. Bad idea number two, Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So, now notice the language. Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian maidservant Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. There's the language. Oh, she'll be your wife. The Lord, this is how, this is how the Lord's going to bless us. Verse 4 through 6, he slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew that she was pregnant, now here is the beginning of the snowball. Snowball that just immediately rolls out of control. And you know right away that this was a bad idea. When she knew that she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai says to Abram, you are responsible. Now, for what it's worth, it's true. Abram should have been a man. He should have been a leader, and he should have said, Sarai, Hagar, that woman is nasty. That, that would have been the godly thing to have done right off the top. Just like, what are you even talking about, Hagar, Hagar? Um, but he didn't. And so now she says, you're responsible for all the wrong I'm suffering. I put my servant in your arms, and now that she knows she's pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Now, here's another very leaderly, you know, thing. Abram goes, your servant is in your hands. Do whatever you think is best. You know, I didn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> then Sarai turns around and starts mistreating Hagar. And so Hagar is like, I'm out of here. And she flees. She flees from the camp. Verse 7 through 10. So the angel of the Lord found Hagar and he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where are you come from? Where are you going? It's very reminiscent of the garden, as if the Lord didn't know where she had come from or where she was going. She says, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarah. And she answered, and then the angel of the Lord says to her, listen, go back to your mistress and submit to her. Go back and submit to her. And then he adds, I'm going to increase your descendants and they will be too numerous to count. The point is this, I'm going to take care of the child that's in your womb. Don't worry, don't, don't be in fear, go back, submit to her. I know this is rough because you can't have a multitude of children unless the one that's in her womb survives. This is, you're going to have a multitude. He goes, look, I'm going to take care of the child. And then in verse 11, the angel Lord says, listen, you're with child and you're going to have a son. You shall name him Ishmael, which means the Lord hears. Now, the Lord does not just randomly name children because he thinks it sounds cool. He's not like, oh, I'm going to call you Apple or whatever. Um, Gwyneth Paltrow, I'm not sorry if anyone here is named Apple or, you know, whatever. <laughs> Blade or something, you know, like the Lord doesn't just go, yeah, that sounds cool. He speaks meaning because there's only a handful of people in Scripture that the Lord names before their birth. And one of them is Ishmael, which means the Lord hears because that is the essence of who the God of the Bible is. He condescends. He lowers himself. Look, he's God Almighty in heaven. He's transcendent. He is more than we can begin to even fathom or wrap our heads around. I mean, he spoke and the universe came into existence. But he has chosen, because he's good, to reveal himself. And philosophically, in order for the unfathomable to be comprehended or re revealed to lowly humans, he has to condescend. He has to lower himself, veil himself, in order that we can begin to see a little bit of his glory of who he is. 
He lowers himself to hear our misery. All of the, he is the God who's constantly coming down. He shows up throughout the scriptures. Verse six, uh, 13 through 16 so then Hagar gave this name to the Lord. This is amazing. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her, and she said, you are the God who sees me. You are the God who sees me. Now, how many wives here in the room want a husband who does not see you? <laughs> no one, right? Everyone's looking for someone who, he sees me, he hears me, he feels me, he gets me. He bothers to listen. And all of us husbands are generally pretty bad at that. We're working on it. Forgive us. And then she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. Again, this is the essence of the God of the Bible. He is the one who sees us. When you lay on bed at your bed at night and you're in agony, something's going on in your life circumstantially, he cares. And it's not just for you. It's for the millions throughout the earth that God is condescending. He's lowering himself. He sees us. He hears us. This is how the Lord of the, of the Bible continually reveals himself, expresses himself throughout the scriptures. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and he gave the name Ishmael to the son that was born. He was 86 years old. 86 years old. Now we're skipping forward to chapter 21, a few chapters later, and now their names have been changed to Abraham and Sarah. And now the Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he had said, because he's always faithful. Very rarely is he faithful according to our time frame because this, by the way, is like 14 years later. So 14 years ago, they got impatient with the Lord's promises and like, hey, maybe we'll do this whole Hagar thing. And then 14 or so years later is when the Lord actually fulfilled the thing that they got impatient about 14 years ago. I mean, this is, the Lord is always faithful. He always fulfills his promises, but almost never according to our timetable. It's an important lesson. The Lord did for Sarah what he had promised because he always does. Sarah became pregnant, and she bore a son to Abraham in his old age. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded him. Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born. So, again, as I, as I said, I, um, uh, I have three biological children, three biological daughters, and then my wife and I adopted a son and then a daughter. We got them both as infants. And so with every one of our kids, we always, we would go like, you know, we watch these videos on how to be good parents, and we would take them home from the hospital, and we're like, this one's going to sleep in the crib. Oh, you can bet this one's going to, they're not going to interfere with our lives. We're going to get a good night's sleep. They're going to sleep in the crib. And then like day one, they're in bed. And I don't say anything because she's doing like 98% of the work anyway. Um, and at first, it's kind of neat, you know, because even though I know people are like, it's dangerous. Um, but, you know, there's this cute little, they, they smell neat, they're in bed, and you're excited, and they're new and fresh. Um, but they're in between Joel and his wife, Amy. And, um, and then they start, like, growing legs and arms. And the weeks and the months start expanding and then you're like so how long how long is this going to be in bed with us and then eventually they kick you out and then and then I end up down here this is real in this little space it's like this big between the bed and the wall and I'm down here with my blankets with the spiders at night they're like running across your face and and then you you like come up on the bed and you're like hey what are you <laughs> what are you guys doing and they're like get back down there in the hole and they, like, throw a bottle at you or something. And you're like, ah, mine! And um, everyone is just, <laughs> I'm exaggerating a little bit, but literally my son, <laughs> my son would take the bottle because he was adopted, so he's nursing. I mean, he's not nursing. He's, and then when he was done with the bottle, he would be like, and he would just spike it over the edge of the bed. And, like, milk would get in my face. And I'd be like, what are you, <laughs> what are you guys doing? And they'd be like, so, um, verse 8, the child grew and was weaned. The point in all that is I can very much relate to Father Abraham. On the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. <laughs> what are you guys doing this weekend? You guys want to have barbecue? Sarah 
So now here's the snowball. Sarah saw the son Hagar, the Egyptian had born to Abraham, was mocking. So now Ishmael is mocking Isaac. Now Paul, later in Galatians, says that Ishmael was persecuting. Scholars wrestle with what exactly was happening, but something was happening where the first son was giving the, the young son a difficulty. Now remember it began, oh hey, here's a great idea, Abram. She'll be your wife. Here's the, notice the language now. Get rid of that slave woman and her son. Sarah is mad. Get rid of that slave woman. Wait a minute, I thought this was his wife. Get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son, Isaac. Okay, so the thing is already completely out of control. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. Abraham loved Ishmael. This was his son, 14 years old at least, and he was really upset, and God said this, and this is one of those harsh passages in the Bible where the Lord says, listen, Abraham, I know this is rough, but you have to understand, I have a plan. I have a plan to redeem all of the world, and I chose you, and I'm turning you into a family. I'm going to turn that family into a people who will become a nation. They'll become a holy womb, and out of which comes Jesus who's going to restore all things. And you have to understand that this is tough, but there's a bigger thing at work here. And, and, and it can't be thwarted. And he goes, listen, um, don't be distressed about the boy. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you. Because it's through Isaac that redemption is going to come. It's through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. And I'm going to make the son of your maidservant. I'm going to take care of Ishmael. He says, but you're going to have to kick him out of the camp. So early the next morning, Abraham took some food and water, and he sends off Hagar and Ishmael, and he sends them out in the de into the desert. And essentially what happens, Genesis 21, 14 through 16, is that Ishmael is dehydrated. He's out of water. Hagar goes, I can't watch him die, and she sticks him under a bush, and she just takes off about a bow shot away, and she goes, I can't, lis I can't listen to him as he's, as he's dying. And she's sobbing. And so he's sitting there just like his father has just abandoned him. He just got kicked out of the camp. He lost his family. He lost his inheritance. And now his mother abandons him. He's sitting under a bush. And then the angel shows up again. Verse 17, God heard the boy crying. And the angel of God said, Hagar, what's the matter? Don't be afraid. Like, don't you remember I told you I'm going to take care of the boy? She said, the Lord says, lift him up. I told you I'm going to make him into a great nation. So God opens her eyes, and she saw a well of water. <laughs> she's about to let her son die, and then she's like, oh, <laughs> there's a well right here. Um, it's like one of those, like, honey, have you seen my phone? And you're like, oh, sorry. So she went, and she filled the skin of water, and she gives the boy water to drink. God was with the boy as he grew up, and it just, you know, we got all these details, and just kind of fast forwards. It just zip, zip, zip. He lived in the desert. He became an archer. While he was living in the desert, his mother got him a wife from Egypt. Everything's okay. So here's the thing. The reason I wanted to read this whole story is we hear these kind of stories, like Old Testament stories. We learn about them in Sunday school, and it's almost like they become almost like fairy tales. We're detached from, they're just a story, but they're so far removed, thousands of years you know, ago. And the thing of it is, is is as much as this has been imprinted into our Bibles, you know, and it's been read millions of times all over the world, this actually happened to a real little kid. Like, we don't usually think about this. This little kid, Ishmael, this is his life story. Like, this actually happened to a real kid, and it's in our Bibles. And so we have to sort of put ourselves into Ishmael's shoes for a minute. He didn't make the decision for Abraham to sleep with Hagar. Like, that wasn't his fault. He was just born... He had a father, he had a mother, he had an inheritance, he was living at home, you know, all this. And all of a sudden, in one day, his whole world gets turned upside down. And he's out in the desert, his father's just kicked him out, he doesn't really understand what's going on. And then his mother abandons him, and he's literally dying. And then the Lord intervenes and saves him. This was a, you know, to, to use modern counselors, this was a traumatic event. This was a traumatic event in his life. And so here's what's interesting is that today, Islam, you know, we look at the world today, we Christianity, Judaism, Islam, what's this all about? And I go, guys, this thing is completely rooted in the biblical story. Um, in the 7th century, you had a guy named Muhammad. He lived in Arabia, the Arabian Peninsula. 
and he believed that he was a direct descendant of Ishmael. Most of the Arabs of the Middle East today believe that they are literal bloodline descendants of Ishmael. And so they have this Ishmaelite identity. And Muhammad was this young guy who, when he was young, um, when his mother was pregnant, his father died. Then when he was a little baby, his mother died. He went to go live with his grandfather. So he, had, he was orphaned. I mean, he kind of had some similar trauma in his life to his ancestor Ishmael. It's actually interesting that that sort of orphan, abandoned spirit story was in Muhammad's life. And then uh, even his grandfather died when he was pretty young. He ended up marrying this woman named Khadija, who was like 15 years older than him. She was a real successful businesswoman. And he became her primary um, worker for her caravan company. He's out in a cave fasting and praying during Ramadan, because in Arabia, even before Islam, even the pagans used to have the holy month of Ramadan where they would seek their various gods, make pilgrimage um, to Mecca. And as the story goes, according to the Islamic story, this angel shows up to Muhammad in the cave and it starts choking him, crushing him. Again, this is not a Christian retelling of the story. This is according to Islamic source documents. It's crushing him and it demands of him in Arabic. It says, Ikra, which is recite in Arabic. This is where you get the word Quran, Ikran, the recitation. And he goes, I don't know how to recite. Because the idea was in 7th century Arabia, you had these ecstatic poets. They would allow spirits to sort of channel through them and they would recite Arabic poetry. And he thought that's what the spirit was saying, is allow me to speak through you. Because I don't know how to do that. A second time it chokes him and he describes it as this dark presence to where he thought he was going to die. And it says, Ikra. And he says, I don't know how to recite. The third time it happens, and on the third time this presence demands, recite. And he opens his mouth and the first words of the Quran begin flowing out of his mouth. This is the beginning of Islam. This is then, essentially, he went back, by the way, as the story goes, he, was, he believed he was demon-possessed. Muhammad believed he was demon-possessed. He thought that experience was demonic. He, believed, he was suicidal. He was shaking, trembling for days, for weeks. He goes back to his wife, Khadija. Again, she's going, oh, great. My new husband, my primary worker for my company has gone crazy. And she goes, no, 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 no. You're not demon-possessed. You're a prophet. Go with it. And she encouraged him to allow this to start taking place. This is how the Quran, we got the Quran today. The Quran is like the Bible of Islam. Now, that's the story. You don't need the discernment of a log to say that was not an angel, right? I mean, let's just be honest. That was not an angel. That was a deceiving, demonic encounter. Today in the world, you look out, the world is you know, riddled with religious conflict. Let's step back for a minute. Look at the biblical story. Look at the story of Ishmael. Look at the trauma of his life. Look at this, this vessel named Muhammad who had a lot of the same experiences. And what does Islam teach? What, what are the doctrines of that revelation that came out of that experience? God has no son. God is not a father. This is the essence of what Islam teaches. And then interestingly, Ishmael, not Isaac, is the true heir of Abraham. So essentially, in my opinion, Islam is the, is the doctrinized, creedalized expression of Ishmael's brokenness expressed through Muhammad. All of the trauma, all of the pain of abandonment, that orphan spirit actually was birthed as a religion through a broken, crippled individual who allowed that spirit to begin speaking through him. And it's gone on to now become the world's second largest religion, which again, you go, why is that evil? Because at the core essence of what the God of the Bible has revealed is that he is indeed a father who has a son. And it's through that expression, through that revelation, that he has chosen to adopt his enemies in order to become his children. 
This is how redemption is going to come out to all the world. And Satan comes out and he doesn't make any qualms about it. He goes right for the essential, most foundational, important doctrines of the historical Christian faith. And he says, no, God is not a father. God does not have a son. I'm going to tell a story. I call it a tale of two fathers. Um, it's, it's a sort of analogy I use to try to express the difference between the God of the Bible and the God of the Quran. See, the God of the Quran expresses himself as the God who is transcendent. He's big. He's great. He's unknowable. He's unfathomable. He's unreachable. So therefore, when Christians say God is a father, they go, no, 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 no. Muslims say, you're trying to liken the unknowable almighty to something on earth. You're trying to lower him. You're trying to diminish him. Don't do that. That's blasphemy. It's the worst form of blasphemy. They go, no, 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 just allow God to be great, 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 great. And throughout the scriptures, I mean, sorry, throughout the Quran, um, the Lord is, Allah is constantly, the God of the Quran is constantly saying, don't do that. It actually rebukes Christians. It actually says, don't say that God is a father. If you do, the earth is about to crumble like it's such a blasphemy, right? So this is sort of the doctrine of Islam. Over here you have this God who's great, 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 great. Don't lower him. Over here you have the Bible, which says that God is choosing, willingly revealing himself, lowering himself. That's the essence of who he is, right? Okay, so one day a father comes home from work, and he's tired, he's been working all day, and his kids are like, Daddy, you know, will you play with me? And he's like, you know, he's tired, but he gets down on the carpet with his little kids. And, um, of course, you know, I had daughters at first, so what, is the, what do they always want to do? They're, they, what do you want to play? Barbies. Awesome. Because that's what I love to do. That's what, and so, you know, you're down there and, you know, you're tired. And you pretend that you're playing, but actually you start sleeping. So... As long as you're giving it a little effort. But here's the funny thing, too, with Barbies, if you're a new dad, is when you have an avatar or, like, a, a, a puppet, 10 seconds they forget it's you. You can extract any information from them through a Barbie until a certain age. So, is there any boys in your class that you like? They'll tell you. They won't say it to you. They'll tell Barbie. What? What? I mean, what? <laughs> it's funny. It actually kind of works with adults. Like, you get the guys up there, and they're like, you're such a jerk. And, like, you're out in the audience going, man, that puppet's mean. You know? You're like, no. It's, um, so, anyway, the dad gets home. He gets down on the carpet. He plays with his kids. Why? Because I love playing with Barbies? No. It's because I don't mind looking like a complete moron. Because I love my kids. You don't even think about it. You don't think, oh, yeah, I look like a complete idiot. It's my kids. And now with my son, I get down and I fight him. I let him, I may pretend that he's beating me. Of course, in like another year, he will. <laughs> That's what dads do. That's what a father does. Now, the other father comes home from work, and he's like, you know, he's tired. And the kid's like, daddy, daddy, well, you know, daddy's home. Daddy, will you play with me? And he goes, don't you know who I am? I'm the uh, executive of the highest paid rubber manufacturing plant in the tri-state area, whatever, you know. Like, don't you know who I am? No, go play with your siblings, right? I'm too important. I'm too big to get down there and play with, I'm to humiliate myself. I don't do that. So, you know, it's a simple, simple analogy. Now, by the way, with my adopted children, I've kind of modified it because, like, with my son... My, my first adopted child, his biological mother was amazing. We love her, and, you know, we were in relationship with her, and she just had some really hard times and asked us if we would um, adopt Levi. And, um, but the father, you know, by age 25, he had several kids, none of which he had anything to do with. Like, bio, he, my son will know his biological mother growing up, you know, she's maybe kind of like an aunt figure, but he'll never meet his dad. Like, he'll know that he exists, but he'll never, ever meet him. 
Like he doesn't, the truth is like th this analogy between the two is one comes home and plays with his kids, humiliates himself because he loves his kids. The other one really, he doesn't even come home. Like I shouldn't even have him come home and say, no, I'm too important. Like he doesn't even show up. This is a perfect analogy between the difference between the God of the Bible and the God of the Quran. One God loves his children. The other one is too great. Now, who do you want to be your father? It's a pretty simple question. Which one is greater? Which God is greater? Which man is greater? The one who humiliates himself or the one who's trying to protect himself from humiliation? True greatness doesn't need to be protected. God is great. You can't diminish him. You can't lower him. He is the creator of all things. Now, here's the point. Islam, the doctrines of Islam, it is the greatest antichrist doctrine, the greatest antichrist religion that mankind has ever produced. It's swept up a large percentage of the world into this false, um, counterfeit, false religion. Islam will lead no one to, to heaven. Not a single person is not going to come through the doctrines of Islam. However, if I was to come up here and put up pictures on the screen of you know, little children, you know, on the side of the road with an empty bowl and a fly on their brow and this sort of thing. You go, oh, you know, they're so, they're so needy. You know, they're so helpless. I just want to rescue them. And, you know, cute little kids tug at our heartstrings. But here's the thing. Muslims, from a spiritual perspective, from God's perspective, I think through God's eyes, Muslims are the spiritual orphans of the world. They're the spiritual orphans of the earth because they are working so hard. And believe me, most of them pray more than most of us. Most of them do all the religious hoopla much more than a lot of Christians. And at the end of, the, at the end of their life, they're working for a God who's not even showing up. And the reward for all of that religious hoopla is the lake of fire. They're searching for God, believe me. The majority of Muslims that I meet are searching for God, but they're looking in the wrong places. And here's the thing, guys. We have the message that they need. We have the words of life. We are the stewards. We are the stewards of the message of the God who is not, he's, he doesn't mind humiliating himself. It says he actually made himself a servant. He took on the form of a servant. He allowed himself to be mutilated because he loves us so much. And if Muslims are ever going to come into the relationship with God that we have, we have to start seeing Muslims as people just like us who need the mercy of God just like us and say, yes, let's, let's approach this from a more nuanced perspective. The doctrine of Islam is evil. Yet there are elements of Islam of things that we agree with. It's not like every doctrine of Islam is, is evil. There are, Satan always candy coats his poison. Let's just be honest. But by the same token, Muslims are people just like you and me. And there's not a single person in this room that deserves to be saved more than the worst, most evil terrorist in ISIS. No one in this room deserves to be saved. We deserve hell, but the Lord gave us mercy. That's a hard pill to swallow. But if you think you earned it, then you, are, you haven't embraced the gospel. So this is the great challenge of the, of the days ahead is this giant of Goliath is rising up and we have to approach this thing. It, Satan's coming at us with both barrels blazing. It's going for the jugular vein. We're going to come at it like David to Goliath. We're going after this thing, but we're going to do it in the spirit and the attitude with the mind of Christ. We're not going to go after it with the carnal, fear-based uh, mentality that so often defines the current age that we live in. Amen? So amen. I'm going to pray, and uh, we're going to break for this afternoon. Father, I thank you for this house. We thank you that this room is filled with people who know you. You've saved us. You've opened our eyes. You made us your own. We ask that you would help us to see things the way that you see it. We ask that you would help us to see Muslims or Democrats, or Republicans, or conservatives, or whatever, you name it, we ask that you would help us to see others the way that you see them, as people in need of the mercy of God. We ask that you would help us to be vessels, conduits of your Holy Spirit, 
that you would do for them what you did for us and that you would help us, give us courage to open our mouths, that we would be excited about the message that we are stewards of. We ask that this house would be a house of salvation where new people would be brought into the kingdom, where the invitation to the wedding feast would be extended throughout the week, throughout the city. We commit ourselves to you, and we thank you for these things. In the name of your son, Jesus, amen.